Hi everyone and welcome to part 2, as you can see somewhere above my head, of our High Yield Cardiology Interactive Video Series. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, you can go ahead and check it out on our channel so you get the idea of these videos. So good luck and let's get started! How do you diagnose acute pericarditis? Think of the physical and the EKG findings. Answer. The patient with acute pericarditis will present with chest pain. So what do you have to rule out immediately? Of course, MI. And how do you do that? With EKG. And indeed, the best initial test for diagnosing acute pericarditis is EKG. And what is the most accurate test? MRI. Alright, so acute pericarditis presents with very distinctive EKG features. I'm sure you got them right. You will see diffuse ST elevations and PR depressions everywhere on the EKG. You cannot mistake on this EKG for anything else. In the vignette they might also tell you that the patient has chest pain that worsens with lying down and gets better with sitting up. You will also hear pericardial friction rub with the stethoscope, which is the hallmark of acute pericarditis. Question. How do you diagnose chronic pericarditis? Again, think of the physical and the EKG findings. Answer. Any of the causes that can cause acute pericarditis can lead to chronic pericarditis which manifests with fibrosis and calcification and constriction of the pericardium. The best initial test is chest x-ray and the most accurate test is MRI or CT scan. You will see on EKG low voltage QRS complexes and X and Y descents on JVP tracings, very high yield. You will also hear the pericardial knock in mid-diastole because after mid-diastole the right ventricle hits the stiff pericardium and cannot expand anymore. You will also see signs and symptoms of fluid overload like hepatojugular reflex where you press the liver and the neck veins on the same side will enlarge. You will also see the Kuzmal sign which is what? Cosmosine is increase of JV pressure on inspiration because inspiration normally draws blood toward the right ventricle, right? But since the lumen is so small of the right ventricle because it cannot expand from the constricted pericardium, the right ventricle will not be able to expand and the blood will back up in the jugular veins. And you will also notice pulses paradoxus, which is drop in systolic blood pressure with more than 10 millimeters on inhalation. Awesome. Question. How do you diagnose pericardial tamponade? What is pericardial tamponade? Again, think of the physical and EKG findings. Answer. Pericardial tamponade is the accumulation of fluid or blood in the pericardial sac between the fibrous and the serous layers, which similarly to constrictive pericarditis will lead to decreased blood return to the right side of the heart. If they ask you which part of the heart will collapse first, you answer the right atrium. Why? Because it is much weaker than the right ventricle. And if they ask you which ventricle will collapse first, you answer the right ventricle, as the right ventricle is of course much weaker than the left ventricle, which is the more muscular one as it is the main pumping chamber of the heart. Now keep in mind that sudden accumulation of how much milliliters of fluid? 500 in the pericardium will lead to acute presentation. But if the accumulation develops slowly and chronically over months, the pericardial sac can accumulate more than how many liters? 2 liters of fluid before symptoms actually occur. And what are the symptoms? Again, we have the pulses paradoxus, which was 
drop in systolic blood pressure with more than 10 millimeters on inhalation and of course the back striat as you can see here on this slide the back striat consists of hypotension decreased distant heart sounds and jvd notice here that the lungs will be clear super super important here in pericardial tamponade the lungs will be clear tamponade has nothing to do with your lungs on EKG, you will see sinus tachy with electrical alternance. As we discussed before, right? The electrical alternance is a phenomenon used to describe different heights of the QRS complexes. And also you will see right atrial and ventricular diastolic collapse on echocardiography. All right, so moving on to heart failure questions. And the first question is, how do you determine heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Answer. The heart failure with reduced ejection fraction has ejection fraction below 40%, also called systolic or dilated heart failure, due to the dilation of the left ventricle, most commonly due to hypertension, the late stages of hypertension, coronary artery disease, valvular defects, to loss of systolic function of the left ventricle, which is to say that the left ventricle will not be able to contract properly. Question, how do you determine heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Answer, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is also called a restrictive hypertrophic or diastolic heart failure due to the fact that the ventricles are hypertrophied. Now this can be caused by an infiltrative disease or this can be caused most commonly due to systemic hypertension. And when I say that, I mean the early stages of the systemic hypertension, when the heart is able to pump against the increased systemic pressure, which will later on give you heart failure with reduced ejection fraction when the left ventricle starts dilating. Now this hypertension is causing the heart to push with more force so it can overpower the increased pressure in the periphery, right? Now in order to maintain the cardiac output, which is calculated by multiplying what? Yes, by multiplying the heart rate and the stroke volume, you might notice increased heart rate in these patients. Because remember, here the heart muscle has no problem contracting. It can even contract with more power. Question, how do you manage acutely any heart failure? Answer, you start with Lasix, which is furosemide, because they are acutely fluid overloaded, so you have to take care of this first. Then you have to give them oxygen, morphine, you can also start them on nitroglycerin drip or IV nitroprusside or IV hydralazine. Now these three drugs are vasodilators, as you know, and as such will decrease the preload. And along with it, the blood pressure. So in patients, pay attention here is very important, in patients with low blood pressure, you should not give the vasodilators. In hypotensive patients, instead, along with oxygen and diuretics, in the ICU settings, you can start them on IV positive inotropes like dobutamine or amrinon or murinone. Now, nitroprusside is less commonly used, just an FYI, because of the risk of cyanide toxicity. Yes. Now, Quickly, if you can tell me how cyanide causes toxicity, the most common causes and presentation and treatment, it will be awesome. So let's see if you can get this. Answer. Cyanide actually binds to the enzymes of the electron transport chain, specifically here the cytochrome A3 oxidase, which decreases ultimately the ATP production, which will lead to anaerobic metabolic acidosis. The most common causes, as we said, are the sodium nitroprusside, also fires, mining and pesticides. Now, the most common physical symptoms that will give away on the exams that this is cyanide toxicity is the cherry red skin. 
and also if they have inhaled uh, the, the, the fumes from burning of rubber and plastic, the patient will have bitter almond bread. Along with that, the patient will complain of vomiting, nausea, abdominal pain, altered mental status and also seizures. And how do we treat cyanide, cyanide toxicity? With hydroxycobalamin, sodium thiosulfate and amyl nitrate. Question. Mortality benefit treatment for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Super high yield. So if you can think of the medication classes and devices that have mortality benefit will be great here. And we'll go over it together in a second. Alright, so as you can see here, we have seven points for mortality benefit treatment for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now you need to know everything about these seven points. Alright, so let's go over it quickly. Alright, so you should definitely start the patient on ACE drugs, the PRIO drugs, unless the patient is hypotensive. So you start with the low dose first and if they ask you, uh, is it better to keep increasing the ACE inhibitors dose versus uh, adding a beta blocker? Always choose to add beta blocker, okay? Also, this is a good tip for your clinical practice as well because high doses of ACE inhibitors have not proven to decrease mortality. Moreover, the combination of ACE drugs and beta blockers is superior than treatment with either one alone. Now, if your patient is experiencing any adverse effects from the ACE inhibitors like dry mouth, cough, you can switch to ARPS drug. But if the patient experiences angioedema, the ARPS should not be the alternative here because they both cause angioedema. Now the ARNI drug, which is the angiotensin receptor neoplasin inhibitors, is a new drug class that allows an optimization of the heart failure treatment. And here, the one that we have right now is the Sacubitril Valsartan. Now from the beta blockers, the three beta blockers that have mortality benefit are the metoporol succinate, which is the extended release one, which is given once a day, the carvedilol and the bisoprolol. Now here you have to remember to increase the dose gradually over at least two weeks and the target heart rate is 55 to 60 beats per minute. Whereas the ACE inhibitors uh, drugs dose you can increase every day. Another mortality benefit drugs are the spironolactone and eplerinone, which are aldosterone antagonists. They are given to people with New York Heart Association functional classes 2 to 4. And because they can cause hyperkalemia and kidney dysfunction, you should use them only if the creatinine is below 2.5 in men and below 2 in women. The next one with mortality benefit that is especially beneficial for the African American patients with New York Heart Association functional classes 3 to 4 who fail to improve on ACE or ARPS or ARNI, beta blockers and aldosterone inhibitors is the combination hydralazine isosorbate dinitrate. Now number 6 in our list of mortality improving drugs is actually not a drug but a device. Now you use these devices if the ejection fraction is below 35% and the medical therapy is failing to improve the signs and symptoms of the patients. First you start with the life vest. As the name implies, it's a vest that you wear and you have uh, electrodes attached to you the whole time and if the machine detects life-threatening rhythms, it will deliver a treatment shock. And you have to wear this life vest for minimum 3 months along with the guideline-directed medical therapy that we just discussed and that the patient is already on. Next, after 3 months, you will perform an echocardiography and if the ejection fraction is still below 35% and the New York Heart Association functional class is still uh, 2 or 3 and the patient's survival expectancy is more than 1 year, then you can implant a defibrillator, the ICD. Why? Well, in order to prevent arrhythmias and sudden death, which are the most common causes of death in heart failure patients. And of course, if nothing is making your patient better, you should put him on the heart transplant list. And because we spoke about the New York Heart Association functional classes, can you tell me the four New York Heart Association classes here? Mm -hmm. 
Answer. The New York Heart Association functional classes are as follows. Class 1. The patient has no limitations of physical activity. Class 2. The patient has slight limitations of physical activity. Class 3. The patient has marked limitations of physical activity. And here we have class 3a where the symptoms will occur with less than ordinary activity and class 3b where the symptoms of the patient will occur with minimal exertion and the patient will be considered as class 4 if he is unable to carry on any physical activity without symptoms. Question. What is the mortality benefit treatment for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And the answer is that this was a tricky question because there is no mortality benefit treatment for this heart failure. You can treat your patient with beta blockers and diuretics but no mortality benefit has been proven when using them. Here what we want to do is actually manage the underlying hypertension which is as we said the most common cause of diastolic failure and treat the symptoms of the failure as they occur. Alright, so we are done with the heart failure questions and again if you want to listen to the whole, to the entire videos on heart failure for step 1, 2 and 3, please check out those videos on our channel. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed this video and you were able to answer all of the questions. Please feel free to share the link to this video on your social media if you liked it. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to receive notifications if you're interested in more high yield USMLE videos to come. Also, you can follow us on Instagram, this is the name of our official Instagram page, as I'm posting there daily high yield USMLE notes that I guarantee 100% that you will see on your USMLE step exams. I'm not gonna waste your time with material that is not high yield or not heavily tested. And I'm also posting there the slides from our videos as we are still in the process of creating free PDFs from our videos. So until then you can check out the slides there on the Instagram page. Thank you very much for watching again, good luck with your studies and enjoy the journey. See you on the next video.